Hi, and welcome to the Faith Family Church Podcast. For more information about our church and who we are, visit our website, ffcackworth.com. Enjoy the message, and thank you so much again for listening. We're going to talk today about a love story that has always been dear to my heart. It's one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible to me about love. The love of of not just a a man and a woman, or a mother-in-law to a daughter-in-law, or or anything of the sort, or a husband to a wife, but it, 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 it is the love story of God to mankind. It, is, it, it to me is just fathomless is to see the love that's displayed in this little four-chapter book. And it's a book that was written in a time uh, that uh, was uh, judgment was befallen Israel, and judgment was befallen the world. It was God because of the foolishness and and the the amazing thing is nobody really knows the author of this book we've we've uh, believed that times it could have been Samuel Um, we believe that times it could have been maybe one of the other prophets which most likely it probably was Uh, you know what prophet wrote this what man or woman of God penned this word is yet to be determined in in our thinking today but it is without question probably the most beautiful love story of the redempted work of God. Amen. And so when we look at this, cha- this book today, and we're going to just take, uh, for sake of time, I'm not going to, I'm going to touch on all four chapters. Maybe at a later day we'll come back and be able to take a month of, of preaching on this and look at this in, in light of uh, the fullness of what's there. But I just want you to go with me, if we could, this morning to Ruth, the second chapter. We're going to start in verse 13. I know I'm kind of starting in the middle of the swing of things, but there's a reason why I'm starting here. And then we're going to come back to some things. And I hope you understand this morning. I know we've got uh, widows here today that uh, I'm so impressed by many of you that as I've gotten to know you as your pastor, you just... You just never thrill my heart more is to know that in, in your loss of your husbands, yet you have maintained the integrity of your relationship with God. In fact, I'm seeing in most of you that the relationship you have with God is all the greater now because your husband figure is no longer there and God has become that place, that man figure in your, in your relationship that you needed and, and your strength is drawn directly from him. And what better place? You know, even as a husband to my wife, my goal is to always push my wife to fall in love with Jesus more than she loves me. Amen? Or else I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do as a husband. If I'm a husband and I'm being faithful to my wife and to my kids, then I need to help my wife fall in love more with God than she falls in love with me. Because if she falls in love with Jesus, she will love me unconditionally. Amen? And I need a lot of help there. (laughs) You know, because there's times when my wife will just kind of scratch her head and look at me. So, you know, thank God she has the mercy of God and thank God she knows Jesus the way she does because there have been plenty of days where I didn't deserve her love or God's love, okay? Yet she's loved me unconditionally. And, and so I want to encourage you in your relationship. This, this book is not just for the widow and downtrodden, but it's, it's, it's for the husbands and wives. It's It's a book that speaks well to your marriages. It speaks well to relationships. If you're a student seeking out a a spouse, then pay attention to this book, amen? Because this book will tell you how to seek out a husband or a wife. And there's so much in this book that I I can't, literally the whole gospel from Genesis to Revelation is pretty much tied up right here in this redemptive work of this single book. And, And so we're gonna... We'll just read these verses today, and uh, I'm reading from the New King James Version, so if it reads a little different than yours, uh, just be patient with it and, and come along. Then she said, and this is Ruth saying this, and she's speaking to Boaz at the time. She said, then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers 
and he passed the parched grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. I want you to kind of get that, and she kept some back, okay? She had some leftovers. That's basically what he's saying here. And when she arose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Also let some grain fall from your bundle, or uh, bundles fall purposely for her, and leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. Father God, please bless the reading of your word. I need uh, you, God, to just do what you designed to do for this service, God. Talk to us about that intimate love relationship, Lord, that you so long to have with every soul, every man, God, woman, child. God, you've designed this for a reason. And this book is nothing more than a shadow. It's nothing more than a, a glimpse of what you did on the cross. And so, Lord, we thank you for that now, that love that was so designed for me. God, I receive by faith, and by faith I receive it from my brothers and sisters here today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Look at that passage of scripture. We could just kind of lay some groundwork. You go back to chapter 1. In verse 1 it says, and it gives us a lot of insight just in that first verse. Go with me to chapter 1 of Ruth. Verse 1. Now it came to pass in those days when the judges ruled. Okay. Here it is. There's a time frame here that we understand when this book was written. It was written during the days of judges. Now we know, here's some of the judges. You've got... Elijah acted as a judge. He had um, Samson that acted as a judge. There was a variety of different prophetic men that came forth, and they acted as judges, okay? And during their time, and, and this cycle of time is an interesting time. We live under the dispensation of grace right now. There's a dispensation of time. Forever how long that will be, it was from the day that Jesus resurrected to newness of life and went home to be with the Father, and he sent the Holy Spirit until now. We've been living under the grace. We're sin abound, grace much more abounds. We're not under judgment right now. A lot of people feel like we are, but we're not really under the dispensation of judgment. We're under the dispensation of grace. These people at this time were under the dispensation of a time in history that was all about judgment. And it was this evil cycle of Israel falling away from God, and then God would send in a judge, and he would revive them and restore them back to health with God, and then they, and, and they'd be there for a moment, and then all of a sudden, bang, it'd fall again, and bang, it'd fall again. And, and this is recorded about 10 years, or about the they Most believe that it was about in the middle of the book of Judges that this book was recorded, this story was told, okay? And so around the 10th chapter of the book of Judges, we have... Now, here in Scripture, it talks about a place. So a place in time, a place in history, as well as a place within the confines of that. It says Bethlehem. He said, a certain man from of Bethlehem, Judah, went sojourn in a country of Moab with his wife and two sons. Now, again, here I'm trying to give you some uh, understanding of where... Uh, Ruth and Naomi are coming from to help you understand what's occurred, okay? Most of you probably know the story, but for those that might not, just bear with, or, you know, be patient with me. We have that uh, Bethlehem represents a place of bread, of fullness. There should have been more than enough, sufficient, but they find themselves in famine. There's no bread. So then we find that Elimelech his, and the husband of uh, Naomi and his two sons go to the place called Moab. Now, Moab is an interesting place because Moab is a place very sinful. Uh, they worship other gods. It's a place that's definitely not a place you want to go right, try to raise up a church because it's not going to be an easy place to raise up a church, okay? But that doesn't mean you shouldn't, but it just means it's going to be a tough place to go. There's women that like to seduce men. In fact, where this whole tribe... Uh, uh, came to play where this whole race of people came is came from Lot when Lot had incest relationship. He was in it was in a relationship with one of his daughters in a drunken stupor. Okay? And because of it she got pregnant and this whole race of people come from that place. Oh because of it now all this idolatry and all this sexual sinful things that are occurring are in the Moabites. And so that to me really wouldn't be a good place to take your God fearing family and try to find substance for them. But Elimelech does this. And, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, we can pick on the man of God and you can tell him how terrible he was, a terrible husband, terrible leader. I, I wouldn't suggest that to be the best place to raise your family. 
But if God leads you there, then so be it. But anyways, we find that in the process, not only does he die, but his two sons uh, die as well. But before they died, they married two Moabite women, which that wasn't supposed to be either. Okay? So we got all this craziness going on, and because of it, judgment befalls their household. Okay, and so now this woman that went away full is now returning empty. She's returning empty, and not only is she returning empty, but she's got a daughter-in-law. It started off with two daughter-in-laws to return back. She's because she heard the famine was over. She's going to return back to a place of provision for her because she realized without her husband and without her sons and without her heirs, she is abandoned. She is with us without. She is just there abandoned, okay? Now, I know you're saying, Pastor, you haven't even got into your message yet. Just please be patient with me. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. I have you <laughs> should be patient. Okay, so anyways, you got this abandonment. Now, when you think about this, probably the best time in life for you to see a miracle happen in your life is when you're totally out of self-provision. When you get to the lowest, when you become weak, when you become without any self-preservation whatsoever, have you ever been there in life? Yes. I know God brought me there a couple times. Out of my own foolish doings, God brought me there a couple times in my life to where I was so without that God, if I don't have a miracle today, I can't go on. But the beauty is, that's exactly what God wants for all of us. He wants us. David was singing it this morning. I, didn't, I know it wasn't really even a part of the worship service, but it came apart. He said, more of you, less of me. More of you, less of me. More of you, less of me. The Spirit of God was saying that. He'd been saying it all day today. More of me and less of your will. More of my will and less of you. And if i got to take you to a place where i got to let you run... Uh, so deep into it that you so are abandoned by everything in this life to get you to look up to me, then so be it. Amen. And so we find Noamie's finding herself there, totally empty. I'm empty of everything that I could possibly do, God. Now it's all up to you, God, to do what you want to do, what you wanted to do in my life for years. I need your redemption, God. I need you to do something that I can't do. And along with it comes this Moabite daughter-in-law that comes from a place. All her life she's been taught to worship other gods. All her life she's been taught all these influential things that were not of the will of God or the word of God. They were of the will of men. And she didn't know anything better then. But as she met this woman of God and began to learn the heart of Naomi, she wanted to be with this mother-in-law. And she says one of the most powerful prayers that the Word of God has ever shown us is a declaration. She says in verse 16 of chapter 1, But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back and follow after you, or from following after you. For whatever you go, and wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people. And your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death part you and me. Now I can't think of a better place for Ruth to be either. She's totally empty herself of all of what she knows too. So you got both of these women come on the scene. They're coming back to Bethlehem, a place of bread, a place of provision. And they're both totally empty. Ruth has nobody. Naomi has nobody. And without a man figure, without, a redeemer, without their redeemer, that redemptive, that husband figure in their life, they'll have no genealogy. They'll have no going on. My family ends here. Naomi realizes my family's ended here. I'm, my, my, my genealogy, I'm the last of the breed. I'm the last of the last. That's it. After me, there's nothing. And yet this daughter-in-law, her come, they come. And this brings us to the story today where her 
kinsman is. Now, uh, my first thought this morning is she met the man. I used to say this to my wife. She met the man. I'm the man, baby. I'm the man. She had, you know, my wife had a lot of boys chasing after her. They were boys. I was the man. Amen. <laughs> Just left. Come, come back, please. Come back, Jesus. Come back, please. Now, in in some ways, it, you know, this man is the man. Boaz is the man. I mean, this guy, he he's he's noted for uh, wealth in many ways. One of the ways he's noted for wealth is his position. Um, he's a man of influence. He's a man within the community that is very influential. He's a wealthy man financially in the fact that, you know, uh, he doesn't lack for much of anything. Uh, so, you know, she met the man that influenced him in influence of, of statue in the community. You know, if she marries this guy or if she gets linked up with this boy, man, everybody in town knows him. And he's a good man. He's a righteous man. He's a wealthy man. He's an influential man. He can move things in this community. And that's who she's linking up with. And it's quite ironic. She didn't even know where she was going. When she first set out that day, if you read chapter 2, that first couple verses, it talks about that she meets a kinsman. Or, or it talks about there's a kinsman. Noemi's talking about her kinsman. And, and, and I think she was referring to Boaz here, okay? Um, but there was other kinsmen as well. In fact, there was one that was in line before him. And notice, I love this. You've got to get this right from the beginning. Boaz is the only kinsman name there. Okay? Boaz represents Christ here. Okay? Notice that there's only one name. There's only one name given in heaven amongst men where we must be saved. It is Christ Jesus. Notice that this other guy wasn't even named here. He was just another one that maybe could have been. Okay, we got all these could have been, but there's only one Christ Jesus. Amen. You've got all kinds of people believing there's other things, but I'm telling you, this book is so packed full of, of miracles and beauty of, of the redemptive work of God. But I found it interesting that uh, when uh, Ruth sets out that day, she doesn't know where she's going to glean. Her mother in law is telling her about go out, and, and, and or not even, she wouldn't even say go out, she would just say if there's a kinsman out there. So Ruth caught vision of him and said, hey, let me go out, please. Let me go out and work the fields. Now back then, what well, you, you know in Scripture, you'll find in Scripture, you go back to Leviticus, you'll find in Scripture where it talks about that God set up a, a welfare system even back then. He said for all those that farm the field, they were to leave the corners when they, when they farm the field, they, were, they would come around and they would leave the corners full of wheat or whatever else they were growing. And, there, and everything that fell as they went through and harvest, don't bend over and keep picking it up and keep picking it up and keep picking it up. Just leave it lay because there's going to be some poor that are coming behind you. So they're going to have to glean from that as well as the corner of your lots, okay? So we know that Naomi knew about this. She knew that even though I'm without a husband and even though you're without a husband, even though i got to believe there's a kinsman for us. And so what she did is she went out into this field and began to glean behind the reapers. And she had no idea. She had no idea that she was coming into Boaz's field. She just was led. And this is, this is so beautiful. Think about your relationship with God and, and how many times the Spirit has led you without you even really knowing. Am I the only one that's found that to be true in his life? There's times when I think I know what I'm doing, I know where I'm going, and everything's under control, and I'm doing well, and, 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 and the whole time God's leading in another direction, and, and I thought I was there for this reason, but then later on God reveals the reason why you were really there. Okay? And the reason why she was really there was not just to get provision for her and Naomi, but to meet the man. Amen? She, wanted, she needed to meet the man. He was a man of grace because bottom line is he didn't just thrust her off. You've seen the second thought this morning. She met her kinsman. Now, when she first met him, I got a feeling from all indications as you read this word, and maybe, maybe I've watched too many, uh, some of my mother-in-law has been here, I've watched too many of those uh, Hallmark. Hallmark films. You know, and, and it just, you can read into it. You just know where the story's going to go. 
it, it's going to be a happy ending. The boy's going to meet the girl. The girl's going to meet the boy. And forever and always they'll be together. And they'll get rid of all the other guys that are not supposed to be there. And it's that man or that woman that makes Okay. So maybe I've read too many, I've seen too many of the stories to kind of feel that, but I kind of feel that with Boaz. Boaz sees this young lady, and I've got a feeling she was a pretty good-looking woman, okay? She was in the prime of her life. He was a little bit older, so, you know, his body wasn't quite like it used to be. But i got a feeling he was not a bad-looking guy either, okay? Because she was intrigued, and he caught her attention, and she caught his attention. And there was something that, you know, my mother-in-law knows the story, but years ago when I met Melanie, uh, it was kind of strange because there was a boy, a, a friend of mine, a, a college buddy of mine that we, were, we even roomed together for a season, had started writing Melanie. And I didn't know Melanie. They, his family and her, their families were friends from years ago, and now that they've grown up, this man had a liking for Melanie because why not? She's beautiful. It was all these things that I would have loved, and I thank God I had that now in my life. But I remember he started writing, and, it, it, and he told me at the end of the summer, we were for summer school, he said, and we're in a group of guys. I mean, all of us are hanging out at the end of the summer school. There's got to be ten guys in this cafe. We all went out to say goodbye to each other, and we're all hanging out. And why he came to me, but it, it blows my mind. I know now why, but I didn't know then. But out of all these guys that were every bit as good looking or better than me and all these wonderful things, he comes over to me and says, now look, it. when she gets here, you stay away from her, Donald. <laughs> but dude, I don't even know what she looks like. And I'm looking at him and thinking what he looks like and what his taste in women definitely is not going to be my taste in women. So, hey, buddy, just enjoy her, you know? That's what I was thinking. But it was kind of interesting. They invited me to be a part of the welcome crew that year. I was a senior. They had asked me, hey, you need to do this table in our welcome center. So I was doing this table for the welcome center. I'll tell you how good I was about it. I don't remember what the table was all about. <laughs> okay, but I was there. I was trying to be, you know, help be promoting the school. But anyways, the whole point is, I saw Melanie come in with her dad. And no Jim Dishman. Jim Dishman was all about business. He is, hey, business, business. Get this done, get this done, blah, blah, blah. We're out of here. Well, Melanie wanted to check it out, I could see. And whether I liked it or not, I, I couldn't help it, but I checked her out. I mean, she was beautiful, man. She walks in, I see her all the way across the room. And so then I started making noise at my table, trying to get some <laughs> Get some attention. Woman, look over here, man. I, what I'm saying is, I got a feeling that's what occurred on that field that day. This man, who's this woman? He immediately, this is going to show how good God is, too. God doesn't miss a thing in your life, nor mine. He knows every detail about every field that he has. And he knew that this girl was different. She was out of place. She wasn't one of my gleaners. I don't know who this girl is. She wasn't even, she wasn't a slave, and she wasn't even amongst the poor people that I know of this community. This guy was inquisitive. He was sharp. And, and that caught her attention, too. And so he inquired about her. And you know the story here. As she inquired, he begins to tell. Now, she doesn't still know who this guy really is going to be in her life. She just asked him for mercy because she asked him for 13. Lord, if you'll find favor with me, just let me glean with your reapers here. So she wasn't asking for something. In, in, in the scripture here, it talks about that she didn't know the relationship to him. Okay? Moves on that. He didn't condemn her or refuse her. It's quite interesting. Again, he caught her attention. She caught his attention. This, I know this woman's in need. And, and, and you know, I'll tell you, he, he knew before she knew. Because he found out when, he, when it was Ruth, he knew exactly who Ruth was, even though he didn't meet her yet. This is his first meeting with her. He knew about her because he knew Naomi. And he'd already heard the story about this daughter-in-law that came home with him, with her. And how all the things that Naomi had went through and how this daughter-in-law has stood by her side and relentlessly just stayed with mom-in-law. She didn't have, she could have went home just like Orpha did to her family and she could have been provided there and she could have found another husband and went on to her lineage. But because she changes, man, I'm telling you, the anointing of God was upon this woman 
So much so that she would eventually become of the lineage of Christ. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's so beautiful here to see the power of this book. We find that um, she didn't, uh, or she uh, would, uh, he would be her avenger or redeemer. He, he was the one that would be the man that would literally do this all for her. She met someone that understood her needs. She met somebody that understood her needs. It's important to understand that, you know, this guy already knew about Naomi. He already knew all what she'd been through, and he knew that this woman was in need. Even if it doesn't go any further than this, I, I, I'm going to help. I'm going I'm to meet her need. I'm going to provide for her. She won his heart, obviously. Not only did she win his heart, but he won hers. They begin to have dialogue with one another, even to the point where he invites her to the table. And he, he literally, in that day, verse 14, it said there, and so Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat bread. Basically, he said, come to my table, come to where my servants are, and I want you to eat amongst my servants just like you're one of us. You're not a stranger anymore, but I'm, he's, not, he's not even married to this woman yet. He's not even redeemed her yet. But his grace, isn't that how God does you? Come sit at my table. You're not even convinced you know who he is yet. You're not even convinced you, you know what, what's happening here, but you feel the compelling of the Spirit of God calling you in. Come sit at my table, son. Come sit at my table, daughter. And she gets a taste, and then she not only has provision for herself, but she holds back provision for her mother-in-law. The Bible said that she held some of that. that after, after she was satisfied, she said she kept some back. In other words, she was going to take it to mom. She was going to take it to the mother-in-law and provide for her as well. Now, the beauty of all this, it just keeps getting better and better and better in his provision for her. He extends mercy and grace uh, beyond measure. The next thought this morning is she met the one who was not ashamed of her. <laughs> uh, this, this, you ever been around? It, it's a sad thing to see in the hearts of family members. But one, a, a dad is ashamed of a son, or a son is ashamed of a dad, or a mom is ashamed of her own children, or a children are ashamed of their own mother. And, and there are reasons why sometimes that might want to enter in because of all the sinful things that can occur within the household at times. Uh, I've met a lot of times people that had no relationship with a parent, a dad or a mother, or maybe both. And there is some resentment that has built up in time through them because of the anger. And to try to help them overcome that, you know, for me, I don't, I, it's hard for me to really relate because I never experienced those things in life. I experienced other things, but I never experienced the, the rejection of a mom or a dad. I never experienced the rejection of family members, husbands, wives. I've never experienced that. So for me, I don't really know how hard and how deep the pain can be. And I don't know how hard it is for some people. I've only can, from the outside, look in and say to myself, thank God, many times I've went home just in my car driving home from meeting with somebody and I'm saying thank you God for your mercy and grace yes. upon my life upon my marriage and upon my children God that my children aren't struggling like that and my family isn't struggling I don't have the taste of that God your mercy found me at a young age and, and God as I begin to apply the word your word just began to play itself out in my life and, and I can't take credit for it anything good in me is only from God it's only from God. And why have I been selected to be of that? I don't know, but this, this I say, it drives my heart all the more to reach out to souls that are hurting like that. It drives my heart all the more to find Ruth's and Naomi's in my world that I can come alongside and try to build up. And if, if, if some way God can use me to be a redeemer and, and a kinsman to him, then God help me to do that. Help me to do it because I've been so blessed. And that's when... Uh, Boaz is. He's so blessed and he's reaching out. He's not ashamed to reach out to her. She's a Moabite, man. That's why the other kinsmen rejected. Notice he was going to buy Naomi and he was going to buy the, 
uh, uh, the land and everything, and he was going to redeem her. But when he found out Ruth was involved, what did he do? Uh -uh. I don't want that woman. I don't want that Moabite woman to infect my family. I don't want her to come in here with her idolatry and, and haul her evil ways and try to affect my family. Uh-uh, I'm not taking her in. You take Boaz. Isn't that like how we do people in church sometimes? Because they don't look like us, they don't sound like us, they don't smell like us, they don't come from the back. Their color of skin is different than mine. Come on now, be truthful. You thought the thoughts. Maybe you've not done the actions, but you probably thought the thoughts at times. Because I know I have. I'm going to be honest with you. There's times when I didn't want to be around somebody because they were embarrassing to be around. The way they acted, the way they did things, they, the way they smelled, they, the way they dressed. I, I, I don't want everybody to think that's who I'm like and that's what I'm like. Come on. We've all done this. We've, if nothing else, we've had the thoughts. You. wasn't ashamed to receive what he had. Because I need it. My life is desperate. I need what you got, God. I need it bad. She met somebody who planned for her good. It wasn't about his good. Come on, what good is he going to get out of spending more money, risking the influence of his integrity to take on a more white wife well, come on, what good is he going to get out of any of it? Okay? I'll tell you, in, in his life, he didn't even know this is coming back to the human side of Boaz and not the spiritual side. The human side was about to reap the benefits of being of the lineage of Christ Jesus. Amen. Wow. Hallelujah. The seed of Jesus was going to come through his loins and the, loin, and, and the womb of his wife Ruth. His wife Ruth, the Moabite. His wife Ruth. No other wife he had. His wife Ruth, the one that shook the bed. But what? Because he showed mercy and grace. And you can see that at the end of this fourth chapter, that it was from the seed of Boaz and Ruth come Jesse, which is the dad of David, which is in essence, the great, great, great grandfather of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So powerful, the 
story of love. In every aspect. I can't even, I, I'm not even doing it justice today. He planned for his good. His eyes were over off of his fields. He provided more than enough for her. I love when she goes back to the mother-in-law and she's got the pocket full of the leftovers and she gives it to mom and then she brings back no slave that had no kinsman, no poor person, no widow lady that was gleaning from the corners of the field or behind the reapers would ever come home with maybe more than, you know, uh, a, a couple cupfuls of grain. This woman was bringing back about all she could carry. They said that she was carrying anywhere from 50 to 70 pounds of grain in the first day. They said that that could equate to, for that poor person, a whole year's livelihood in one day she gleaned. Why? Because the man of God scooped it into her. Yes. He went to the, th the, the part that was already separated. He went to the whole grain and he began to scoop it into her back. More than enough. And he got home and, and the mother-in-law said, where in the world were you, girl? Where in the world did you glean all this? And she says, I met a man named Boaz. <laughs> wow, I love this story. I'm, this is making me fall all over in love with my wife again, man. This is fun. <laughs> and my Savior, Jesus, wow. Awesome, awesome. It was his will to bless her. It was his will to bless her. We know the end of the story, but I'll try to cap it off here. That... He went, and there was another man. I, re I remind you of this truth that is so important. The other man's not even labeled there. He's just a figurehead. And, and it says in, in verse, uh, the nearest kinsman said in verse 6, chapter 4, the nearest kinsman said, nearest kinsman, who is this dude? We don't know. It doesn't matter. Okay, he's not both. He's not Christ. That's what matters. The nearest kidman said, I cannot redeem her or it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. What did I tell you? He was embarrassed for this Moabite woman. I don't want her in my household. She'll ruin my whole house. Her ways will ruin my whole house. You redeem her, Boaz. Take her. Enjoy it. Man, what he was saying no to, that guy don't even realize. When you say no quickly, you better be aware of what you're saying no to. It really might be the Spirit of God working on your behalf. Don't quickly run it off. Don't quickly rule it out. Don't know what's going to happen. You never know who's going to walk through that back door. It might be Christ in disguise. Don't, don't, don't. You might be entertaining angels and you don't even know it. Don't quickly run it off. Begin to learn to love. My God loved you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I didn't come to condemn you, Ruth, because you're a Moabite and I'm a Hebrew. But I come to love you. I come to love you. And this morning, as we go to the Lord in prayer with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I pray that somewhere along the line you see the redemptive work of God through the life of Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, and what God had done. And if you read that last part of the chapter, you'll see the lineage, and it leads all the way up to Christ. If you go to the book of Matthew, you'll find Ruth there. You'll find the seed of Jesse there. Amen. And it leads all the way to the birth of my Lord and Savior all the way to the cross, leads all the way to the grave, death, hell, and the grave, and it leads all the way back to heaven in bodily form, the firstborn amidst many brothers, my Lord and Savior's body, soul, and spirit, which resides in the presence of the Father. Amen? And he said, because of that, he said, I promise to you, son, daughter, if you know me as Lord and Savior of your life, and you accept me as the Son of God, that you'll be here with me too, body, soul, and spirit someday. Now we know that day is yet to come for most of us. I, I pray that today is not your day, but if it is, God bless you. Thank you.
What we lost in the garden with Adam and Eve is the reason why Jesus come is to redeem that kinsman, become that kinsman redeemer to bring me back into relationship with the Father. has really nothing to do with heaven and hell. Those are byproducts of your relationship to God. Heaven is that byproduct. Eternal glory is that byproduct of my relationship back to God. And I have to be restored back to Him through the blood of my Savior, Jesus Christ. There's only one way to do that. That's what this story said, and that's what the Word of God declares all through it from cover to cover. And so my heart to you and my heart to us today, and I believe it's the heart of God, is I don't want you just to get out of hell. I want to have relationship with you, Donald. I want to have relationship with you, Faith Family Church. I want to be intimate with you. That's why I spent so much to redeem you back to me. And you're worth it. That's the beauty. God believes we're worth it. I'm worth it. You're worth it. Wow. That excites me. I'm worth it. He sees me worthy enough to spend all that he had to buy me back. So why in the world wouldn't you want to have a relationship with him? Father, our heads bowed and eyes closed. I open these altars. Church, I open these altars to you for prayer, for whatever reason. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then please come. Seek me out this morning. I'm going to spend some time here at the altar. I want you to spend time, if nothing else. Church, maybe you need prayer this morning for whatever. You just want to come and, and make an effort to come. It's the story of coming. Ruth had to get out in that field. Boaz, Boaz had to invite her. There had to be that relationship. There had to be that building, that communication. God communicates to us. We communicate back to Him. We communicate to God. He communicates back to us. And He does that at an altar. He does that at a place of intimacy. So I want to invite you to come to the altar if you need. If not, we're going to close in prayer. Let's stand together for this morning. Thank you for listening to our Faith Family Church podcast. We pray you are richly blessed and encouraged by what you heard. If you would like to give to our church and ministries, please visit our website, ffcackworth.com slash give. Thank you so much again for listening.